let's go ahead and <clears throat> excuse me, let's go ahead and start. Um, I believe we left off on page 1258, uh, Act 1, Scene 5, somewhere on 1258. Um, I want to pick up uh, line 84 and following. <clears throat> the ghost is speaking and the ghost has charged Hamlet with seeking vengeance for his Hamlet Sr.'s death um, in that long speech he tells Hamlet how he was killed and such and then he says actually I'm going to back up just a little bit that he died Line 76 and following. Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannelled, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. A horrible, a horrible, a most horrible. What does he mean by that? You've got several glosses on line 77, I think it is. Unhouseled, without having received the sacrament, disappointed, unready, without equipment for the last journey, unannulled, without having received extreme unction. <clears throat> In other words, he dies full of sin. Okay. Now, I've made the point before that this is perhaps Shakespeare's most religious play, or most theological play because he's there are a lot of theological issues discussed let me put it that way the ghost has already said where is he during the day purgatory. he's in purgatory and we know that because he says he is there for a fixed time till he is purged of his sins okay if you're in heaven Everything's already clear. Everything's already been purged away. Everything's already cleansed. If you're in hell, you're there forever. You don't get out of hell. Okay? Hell is not a place of purgation, so to speak. So he then goes on. So what he's just said is he died without having the opportunity to say confession and receive absolution. Both of which are not Anglican or Protestant beliefs. Okay? Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, like Russian, Greek, etc., Orthodox. Both still have the right of confession and after the right of concession, the right of absolution where the priest absolves one of one's sins that one has just confessed. Okay? He says, I didn't get the opportunity to do that. So, having died, another phrase we're going to hear at some point, having died unshriven, okay, uh, which means unconfessed, unabsolved, the ghost is telling us all these sins are still on my head. They drag him down. It's the purpose for last rites in the Catholic Church. Okay? And that's why you get that line 80, a horrible, a horrible, most horrible. Notice the emphasis there three times. Okay? So he says, if thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But, big but, howsoever thou pursues this act, taint not thy mind. What does it mean to taint something? To mess it up. To mess it up. How much to mess something up, um, 
white paint, whatever the amount, a gallon, five gallon, 10 gallons, how much of another color of paint do you need to add to white paint to mess it up? It could be a drop and it will, it will what? It'll no longer be white. Okay. So Hamlet Sr., the ghost, has just told Hamlet, taint not thy mind. Let your mind stay clear. Let your mind stay. He's almost saying pure because of using that word taint. Okay. So taint not thy mind. Nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave your mother alone. Kill her husband, yes. Don't touch her. Why? Let her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her. Okay? So, leave your mother alone. And what's another, a modern way of kind of saying, taint not your mind? Don't go off the deep, end. the deep end, or don't go off half cocked. Don't, like the kid in North Carolina did last night or this morning, five people killed, you know, some teenagers. Don't, don't be like him, all right? Listen to Hamlet's response. So the ghost leaves, Hamlet gets another soliloquy. Oh, all you host of heaven. That is, everything that is in heaven. Everyone that is in heaven. All the angelic beings, God, the whole shebang. Right? Oh, earth. What else? So, heaven, earth. Remember Theseus' speech? The poet does what? Looks to heaven, looks to earth. And fancies bodies forth the forms of things unknown. So it's like Hamlet sees all the host of heaven. And then he looks down and he sees everything on earth. And then says, what else? What else can I bring into this equation? Well, that pretty much covers everything, right? It's everything out there and everything down here. And shall I couple hell? That is, shall I bring hell into five? Hold, hold my heart. What's the hold, hold my heart mean? What's his heart doing? What happens when you lose someone that you love? What happens when your boyfriend, girlfriend breaks up with you? Your heart breaks. He's saying, keep it together. Hold it tight. And you... My sinews, those things that keep the bones all together. Grow not instant old and bear me stiffly up. Remember thee? Because the ghosts, you know, last words. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Remember me. Remember thee? Ay, thou poor ghost. Whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Now, I'm pointing to my head because I think Hamlet is talking about this globe, his mind. Okay? I've seen productions where Hamlet says, whilst memory holds a seat and he does this kind of thing in this distracted globe, referring by his hand movements to the globe theater. So while the play goes on, right? But also by extension, the whole world. The whole world to Hamlet is distracted. That tracted, it's related to the word tractor something that drags something else, it is distracted. It is dragged away. This globe, this world that Hamlet inhabits, Hamlet is suggested, 
is going in the wrong direction. Okay? So, while his memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, but I do think primarily he's talking about his brain, his mind. Remember thee? How do we know Hamlet's mind is distracted? Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would thaw and melt and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Hamlet, at the beginning of the play, is already considering suicide, or at least thinking about suicide. Remember thee? Yea. From the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there. So the table of his memory, that is like the table of contents. That's what that table refers to. It's not talking about a flat table. He's saying, from the table of contents of my memory, I'll do what? I'll erase it all. The trivial fond records, the kinds of things, trivia that is retained, okay? Saws of books, proverbs, lessons, aphorisms that I've learned from books, all forms, all pressures past, that is, all things that have been imprinted on my memory. That youth and observation copied there. In thy commandment, O alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain. What's the commandment? Talk about the Remember me, in corollary to that, avenge me. What did the ghost say, however? Go back to line. 85 taint not thy mind we use the example of you know a drop of paint in a gallon of paint is enough to taint the paint what is Hamlet, what is Hamlet done with the paint of his mind he's emptied the gallon cleaned out the can and put only what the ghost has said back in he hasn't tainted his mind. He's doing work to it. Cleaning. Cleaning it. He's replacing it. He's reform. You modern language. He's reformatting it so that it no longer runs on DOS per se or pick your operating system. It now runs solely on what? Avenge my death. Okay. Notice he's not doing what the ghost told him to do. He's going against what the ghost told him to do. Yes, by heaven. Oh, most pernicious woman. Oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. Now, the villain, villain, smiling, damned villain, I don't think that's talking about his mother. Okay? He's taking up his mother and Claudius in reverse order of how the ghost spoke about them. The ghost mentions Claudius first, killed me, describes how, and then he brings up Hamlet's mother and says, leave her to heaven. So Hamlet takes them up in the order in which kind of he heard them last. His mother was the last one he heard talked about. He thinks of her. And then he goes to, notice, he doesn't call him uncle. He doesn't call him stepfather. He just calls him villain. My tables, you've got a gloss down there, probably a small portable writing tablet carried at the belt. Me, it is, I set it down that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. And I think it's kind of like, if he is carrying some kind of writing tablet, it's almost like he draws a stick figure. Claudius puts a smiley face on him, 
villain down below. Okay? Horatio Marcellus come in. And they talk to Hamlet. Hamlet talks to them about the ghost. Okay? He gets them to swear that they won't tell anybody. And the ghost cries out under the stage, line 148 or so. Hamlet makes them swear, and he says, no, nope, now you have to swear on my sword. That is, you have to put your hands on my sword. And the ghost says, swear. So they swear. He moves to another part of the stage, still with the sword. So they're going to swear here. They're going to swear here. They're going to swear here. Kind of indicating... It covers every place and everywhere. All right? We get towards the end of Act 1. 164. Horatio says, O oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. O oh, day and night. Kind of like coupling heaven to earth. Day and night, all time. Is kind of meant in Horatio's statement. No one has ever seen something like this. Hamlet. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. And Shakespeare is introducing there an old, old, old idea. And it's the idea of hospitality. Hospitality was a value, a virtue, celebrated and upheld by what are called the Indo-European peoples, or people, if you want, okay? This originally was a small group of people that lived somewhere uh, pretty close to modern-day Ukraine, somewhere between the Black and Caspian Seas, slightly north of them, like uh, seven to eight thousand years ago. Okay, and at some point, we don't know why, that little group started to break up and disperse and go off into various areas. Those people, when they broke up and went off into various areas, they developed the languages that today are modern Indian, not Native American, but these Indian, these kids of Indian, you know, Pakistani, Hindu and such, right? Russian, all the Slavic languages, all the Germanic languages, all the Romance languages, Latin and all of its followers, all the Greek languages, pretty much all the languages of Europe, except for Hungarian, Lithuanian, and Basque. Those three languages, totally not Indo-European, okay? It's the language the largest language group spoken in the world today. All told, even lar larger than the Chinese various languages. Okay? Central to this group's ideology, and we know this by looking at the mythology and poetry of this group, is this idea of hospitality. Or what the ancient Greeks called Xenia. It's where we get the word xenophobic. Okay. This kind of refers to others, aliens. But you practice xenia, it's not z or xenia, xenia. You practice that by doing what? Showing hospitality to strangers. Okay. It's in Homer's Odyssey, where people show kindness to strangers, and that's you know a phrase that's used going way back. Why? Because it was thought often the gods appear as strangers, as vagabonds, as wanderers. St. Paul does the same thing in the New Testament. Entertain strangers. Why? Because you will entertain angels unawares. So Hamlet just told Horatio. Horatio says this is one that's strange. And therefore, as a stranger... Give it welcome. That is, accept what has come, Horatio. Don't shy away from this wonderful strangeness. Just let it flow. Embrace it. 
There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. All right? Do we know what Horatio's philosophy is, strictly speaking? Not necessarily. Notice he does have a Latin name, Hamlet's Germanic. Okay? Gertrude is Germanic. Claudius is Latin. Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo are all Latin. It's often suggested because of what's going to come out a little bit later in the play that Horatio is a Stoic. The ancient Stoics, Stoics essentially said, you know, the key to a happy life is to just maintain an even keel. No matter what happens to you, don't get upset, don't get depressed, don't get elated, just kind of be apathetic, not apathetic. Have no desires, because what will happen if you have no desires? If you have no wants, if you have no passions, you'll never be let down, right? And then when you die, you die and that's it. So. There is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy. Because the Stoic said, this is all there is. There's nothing else. So, seeing a ghost is outside the realm of Stoic philosophy. Because the Stoics didn't believe there could be ghosts. They didn't believe in a soul that lived after the death of the body. But come, here as before, and never so help you mercy, how strange or odd so, er, so I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think me to put an antic disposition on. Okay? Antic. He's going to act crazy. All right? So he says, from here on out, however crazy I act, don't ever give out that you know I'm acting. Right? When Hamlet gave the oath that this two two sullied flesh would melt, had he seen the ghost at that point? No, he had not. Did he know his father was murdered? No, he did not. Okay, and yet he's already contemplating, thinking about suicide. He's already contemplating, thinking about this world sucks. And then you die. All right? So that's before he puts on the antic disposition. That's before he starts play acting. Remember, he's already introduced this idea that people can pretend to be something they are not. He talks to his mother about all of the actions that show his mourning for his father and he says these are but actions a man may play so now he's talking about more play acting all right and the ghost makes them swear because beneath the stage he says swear hammer shh, 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 calm down calm down so if you love me don't let anything out, all right? Act two, we're back in Polonius's house, okay? And we see Polonius talking to his man, Reynaldo. What does he want Reynaldo to do? What command does he give Reynaldo? Louder? Give somebody money? Kind of, partially at least. He's going to send them to France. For what purpose? Isn't his son going to France? To spy on his son. See? What were his last words to his son? Here's a list of precepts. A list of proverbs I'm giving you. Follow these. All right? He sends Reynaldo to do what? To see if he's obeying him. So there's more spying going on. Notice 
People are being observed even when they're no longer in Denmark. There's this mentality of always having to keep an eye on everybody else. All right? So, he says, you got it? You understand what your job is? Don't be seen. Don't let Laertes know you're doing this. He goes, okay, I got it. So, Ophelia comes in. Now, from what we've seen in the play, what was Ophelia's, Ophelia's, excuse me, last interaction with Polonius? About Hamlet. About Hamlet, okay. What did Polonius teach her about Hamlet? Pretty much the same that her brother did. Hamlet doesn't really love you. He doesn't love you in a permanent sense. Hamlet wants to get into bed with you. Don't take his quote unquote tenders of love as being real love. In fact, Polonius takes it one step farther than Laertes did. Polonius tells her, break it off. Do not see Hamlet, period. And she says, okay, I will obey your will. Now she comes in. And he says, how now, Ophelia, what's the matter? Notice the first sentence is an exclamation. I think that's because when Ophelia comes in, he looks at her and he's like, what's wrong? Her appearance when she comes in the room, okay? Or when she, excuse me, comes on the stage, tells us she doesn't just walk in calmly and peacefully. She kind of comes running out and looks frightened, looks disturbed. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, I have been so frightened. What, 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 what? In the name of God. As I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, that is, unbuttoned, untied. I've already talked about what that is an indication of in Shakespeare's day. Love sickness. No hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, that is, his stockings not pulled up tight, but falling down around his ankles. Okay. Um, Unguarded and down jive to his ankle, pale as a shirt, his knees knocking each other, and what looked so piteous and purport as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of course, he comes before me. Polonius, mad for thy love? What does he mean by mad? It's not the modern American usage. Crazy. Out of his mind because of his love for you. My Lord, I do not know, but I fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard, then goes he to the length of his arm. So he grabs her wrist like this. So Ophelia's here, Hamlet's here. He grabs her wrist and he goes all the way to the extension of his arm and her arm, right? And with his other hand thus over his brow, so he's holding her like this, his hand over his brow. He falls to such perusal of my face as would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last a little shaking of my arm and thrice his head thus waving up and down he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. And that done, he lets me go and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes. So he lets go of her finally, and he just keeps looking like this, but he's walking this way. So why is he looking back at her? And not looking where he's going. He doesn't want to stop seeing her. He's so madly in love. Just the mere glimpse of her sight is what kind of keeps him going. But, big, big but, when does this scene come? What immediately preceded this? What did Hamlet tell Horatio and Marcellus? He's going to act crazy. He's going to act crazy. 
See, everything from that scene on raises a question. Is Hamlet acting crazy? So is he acting crazy in every scene that he's in? Or is some of it not acting and some of it's real? It's unclear. Okay? It's one of the genius aspects of Shakespeare's creation of this play. All right? So, Polonius, we got to go talk to the king. This is the very ecstasy of love. I think I've mentioned before. Ecstasy means what? It's a Greek term. It literally means where the soul leaves the body. Okay? We would call it, using kind of more modern terminology, an out-of-body experience. The, the best, quote-unquote, examples of those are near-death experiences or death experiences where somebody talks about, you know, I was on the operating table, I was brought into the emergency room, and suddenly I was looking down at my body. There's hundreds of cases of this, okay? And saw the doctors, you know, doing stuff and pumping my heart and everything, and then I woke up, kind of a thing, okay? In literature, the examples are usually used of lovers, okay? Where the souls leave the body and the souls communicate and fall in love and then go back into the bodies and then the bodies meet and kind of do that, okay? So, he says, whose violent property, that is, love's violent property, foredoes itself and leaves the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven. In other words, people do what for love? Crazy things. You know, murder of passion. Guy comes home from work, finds his wife in bed with his best friend. You know, it's a crime of passion. It's not premeditated, etc. So, he says, have you given him any hard words of late? Did you tell Hamlet he's ugly, that you hate him, whatever? No, I just did as you commanded the blame. I repelled his letters and denied his access to me. Yes? Does Hamlet actually love Ophelia or is he just actually It's a love? good question. Um, have you finished the play? Well, I will talk about that when we get to the end. You have to read the, you have to get to the end first, especially Act 5. Okay? Um, so bring that back up. So Polonius, this has made him mad. Again, not angry, crazy, lunatic. Remember? Poets, madmen, lovers, they're all the same. I am sorry that with better heed and judgment, I had not quoted him. Polonius is here admitting an error. I feared he did but trifle and meant to rack thee. What, what, what's meant by to rack thee? To lay upon you. Like to be put on the rack, spelled R-A-C-K. Okay. All he wanted was sex. Polonius says, I thought. He uses that past tense. Why? Because Polonius now is saying, oops, I was wrong. It is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves and our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. He's kind of suggesting, I was looking at Hamlet through my eyes not through his eyes. When I was Hamlet's age, what did Polonius want? To wreck women. Now he's kind of suggesting, oh, I've really effed things up. Hamlet really does love you. And now we've made him crazy. 
Okay, scene two. So act two, scene two. Another room in the castle, king and queen come in, followed by Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Okay. And the king welcomes Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in, and we find out they are friends of Hamlet's. Okay. And he says to them, line four, something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? So call, uh, uh, so call it. Sith, meaning since, neither the exterior nor the inward man resembles what it was. Externally, Hamlet doesn't seem the same. And internally, Hamlet doesn't seem the same. What it should be more than his father's death that has thus put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. Notice, he says, is there something more than his father's death that, look at the language of himself, uh, look at the language he uses, that has put him, Hamlet, so much from the understanding of himself. What does that mean? To be put from your understanding of yourself. He doesn't even know what's going on anymore. He's saying what about Hamlet? Hamlet's crazy. Hamlet doesn't know himself anymore. You know, that's today that could be used as what in a court of law? An insanity defense. Right? And we're going to see in the play, Hamlet is going to use the first insanity defense in history. Pretty sure it's the first. He's going to say, I wasn't me when I did X, Y. Okay? Or he's going to say, it wasn't Hamlet that did this. It was Hamlet's madness. So, he says... I want you both, being of young days brought up with him, you've been best friends from your youth. And so neighbor to his youth and behavior that you vouchsafed your arrest here in our court some little time. I want you to stay here to figure out what's wrong with him. Okay? The queen says, Hamlet's talked a lot about you too. Help us out here. And they say, Rosencrantz, 27. Both your majesty's might by the sovereign power you have of us put your dread pleasures more to command than to entreat. In other words, you could easily order us to do this and not just ask, right? Gildenstern, but we both obey. That is, we obey both your entreaty, your asking, as well as your command. And here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded. We are at your service to do whatever you want. All right. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. Why did Gertrude just reverse the order? It's thought that Shakespeare wants us to see Rosencrantz and Guildenstern almost as ciphers. Not in the sense of a hidden code, but as just a one and a zero or a zero and a one. It doesn't matter what you call them. They're the same. They're, they're like nameless, faceless entities. You can call Rosencrantz Guildenstern. You can call Guildenstern Rosencrantz. It doesn't matter. Tom Stoppard, famous contemporary playwright. Pretty sure he's still alive wrote a famous, famous play in the 60s called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead. And it was a major work in what's called the theater of the absurd. Because it pointed out the whole entire absurdity of life. And if I remember correctly, he has them being called each other's names. Because it doesn't matter what you call them. They're indistinguishable. All right? So, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave. So what are they there for? Keep going. To kind of observe Hamlet again. What's the word I want you to use? To spy. Yeah. They're there to spy on Hamlet. His two seemingly oldest friends from childhood. 
And now they're, they are in the employ of the king to spy on Hamlet, to figure out what's wrong. Yes? So they were asking them to help Hamlet just to spy on him? Yes, you're, you, you've got it exactly right. They're, they are there to report to the king and queen what is wrong with Hamlet. Not to make Hamlet better, okay? If they even could, yes? Were they hired by the king and queen to spy or? Well, if you, it's a good question. Depends on what you mean by hire. Are they being paid by the king and queen? Um, I guess like, is it the king and queen's doing that they're spying on? Oh yes, oh. that's entirely it. That's why he says that you vouchsafe your arrest here at the court. In other words, stay in the palace with us. What does that mean? It's on our dime. Okay. So they say, sure. Polonius comes in um, without Ophelia. And Polonius says, you know, gives them some news. The ambassadors are returned, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, um, the end of his little speech, 48, 49, I found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. First time the word is used. Okay. Speak. First give admittance to the ambassadors. Hear what the ambassadors have to say, then I'll tell you. He said, all right. So Voltamond comes in and Cornelius. We're going to skip everything they say. Um, and the king likes the news that he hears. They leave. And so Polonius now addresses the king and queen as to what he believes is the problem of Hamlet. He says, line 86, I'm going to read this little passage and then tell me what, what does that tell us about Polonius? Just listen to what he says. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, in tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. What does that tell us about Polonius? It's kind of contradictory because he wasn't brief at all. He wasn't brief. He was tedious. What else? It's dramatic. It's dramatic. It's kind of over the top. What else? He's a bit of a brown noser, yeah. What did he tell his son? Keep your thoughts to yourself, take other people's censure, all that kind of stuff. He's violating. And throughout the play, he violates everything he told his son. Yes? Is that on purpose or is it like... Out? Yes. <laughs> what, let, let me back up. What do you mean on purpose? Like, does he do it without thinking about it? Yes. <laughs> he does it because it's his nature to be this way. Notice his advice, again, my opinion, his advice is good advice. The problem is he doesn't follow it. In one sense, Laertes' advice to Ophelia is good advice. She is not noble born. She is not in Hamlet's sphere, right? Be careful is all he says. But he doesn't follow his own advice. That's why she says, don't give me the double standard. Don't be like those good preachers who preach the hard and thorny way to heaven. Meanwhile, you go off and, you know, rack as many women as you can and such. So he gets to, I will be brief. And yet he's just spent, what, eight lines? Not being brief. It tells us Polonius also loves the sound of his own voice. Okay. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, for to define true madness, what is it but to be nothing else but mad? Has he defined it? No. More matter with less art. In other words, get to the point. More matter, more essence. 
with less artificiality. See, Gertrude sees right through Polonius. But bear in mind, what is an advisor paid to do? Advise, give words. So he says, Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity. In pity, tis, tis true, a foolish figure, but farewell for it, for I will use it. Don't shut the hell up. Mad, let us grant him. So, let's assume he is mad. Now what do we need to do? What caused him to go mad? Now remains that we find out the cause of this effect. The effect is madness, so what caused it? Or rather say the cause of this defect. Notice the play on words. Why? Because madness is a defect. Obviously. For this effect, effective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus. Perpend. That is, think, consider. I have a daughter who in her duty and obedience, Mark, hath given me this. And he reads them the letter that Hamlet had given Ophelia. Okay? And so he quotes from Hamlet. Queen, Hamlet wrote this? Yes, he did. King, skipping several lines, how has she received his love? What do you think of me? Notice, what do you think? What kind of response is that? How has she received his love? It's pretty straightforward, right? Does Ophelia love Hamlet? That's what he really means. Did she accept his love? And Polonius responds, what do you think of me? As uh, a man faithful and honorable? Look at how I just gave Claudius's response. It's kind of like, what? How does your question respond or answer my question? I would fain prove so, but what might you think? When I had seen this hot love on the wing, as I perceived it, I must tell you what, that before my daughter told me, what might you or my dear majesty, your queen here think? If I had played the desk or table book or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb. What would you think if I encouraged her, is what he's getting at. What might you think, top of 1268? He says, no, I went around to work. I got busy once I heard about Hamlet's love. He said, Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This must not be. Out of your star, out of her reach. So I told Ophelia, shut it down. You can have nothing to do with Hamlet. I prescripts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens. And he says, and that has caused his madness. King, do you think this thus? Queen, very like. Notice the king's question is to the queen. He should turn to her. Polonius, however, has a response too. Had there been such a time that I have positively said, tis so, that is, this is the way things are, and I was wrong? King, not that I know. Polonius points to his head and his shoulder. Take this from this. If this be otherwise, behead me if I'm wrong. Or, more generally, kill me if I'm wrong. Foreshadowing, Polonius will be one of the corpses by the end of the play. Okay? So he says... If circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid. King, how? How can we try? How can we prove that's what try there means? How can we prove this further? Do they have real evidence? Like court of law evidence? The letter? But, hmm. Polonius, you know how Hamlet sometimes walks for four hours together here in the lobby? 
at such a time, I'll look at the language. What's the rest of the line say? At such a time, I'll read it, somebody. Loose my daughter to him. What does that mean? So kind of like send her out there so they can't go talk to him. What, what kind of language? What, if you lose something on someone, what do you usually loose on them? Like a manhunt. Like dog Dogs. Okay. Like, get him, girl. That's the language he's using. So, she will become what? For Polonius and the king. Another spy. Okay. Notice, be you and I behind an heiress then. What's an heiress? It's the curtain at the back of the stage. Remember the stage looks like this. And here's the back of it. Tiring house is back here. And you've got a door and a door. Those are curtains into and out of the doorways. So if they are behind the heiress, it depends upon the director. Okay, They can literally be on the stage with the curtain right in front of them and the tiring house right here. So if you look closely, you might see their feet beneath the curtains. So he says, we'll be there and what? We'll spy too. We'll watch. But Hamlet comes in, reading a book. So everybody exits, except for Polonius. I'll board him presently. It's a naval term. I'm going to throw a board from my ship to his ship and take control. That's what that term means, right? So he says, how does my good Lord Hamlet? Well, God of mercy, do you know me, my Lord? Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. What's a fishmonger? A seller of fish. What else is it? I hope your footnote has it. An opprobrious expression, uh, meaning bawd or procurer. Do any of you know what a bawd a bod is, B-A-W-D? It's an asinine footnote, pimp. It's a pimp, procurer of flesh, all right? Not like ham and steak, but sex. Not I, my lord. In other words, how dare you say such a thing? Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? What do you... Not assuming anybody does. What do you do when you go to a pimp? What are you looking for? Pretty much only one thing. Sex. You're not looking for, you know, somebody to sit down and philosophize with. Somebody to, you know, go out to do... It's one thing and one thing only. That's why it's honest in Hamlet's mind. I, sir, to be so honest as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of 10,000. Very true, my lord. And then Hamlet brings up maggots. For if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrying, carrion, what? What happens to dead animals on the side of a road? They decay, they decay and... What will you see in them after a day or two? Maggots. Where do the maggots come from? In Shakespeare's day, it was assumed, it was a commonplace idea, that the sun impregnated that carrion, that rotted corpse. And what was born of that impregnation was maggots. They didn't understand microscopic organisms, okay? And then he says, have you a daughter? I have my Lord. And Polonius' response there ought to express some surprise. He's talking about the sun, carcasses, maggots being bred. And then he brings up, do I have a daughter? Let her not walk in the sun. Why not? 
Well, if the son breeds maggots in carrion, what will it do to your daughter if she walks in the sun? Conception is a blessing. Right? All throughout the Old Testament, you're told children are a blessing. But as your daughter may conceive, <laughs> look to it. I mean, if she's walking in the sun, what else is Hamlet possibly suggesting? She's a whore. She's a whore. She's a prostitute. Women with tans, the reputation was if they weren't white, 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 they spent days out in the sun. The only women who spent days out in the sun were street walkers. Okay? Polonius gives an aside. He speaks to the audience. Hamlet doesn't hear this part. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first. Thought I was a fish mucker. <laughs> He's gone, man. Far gone. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? And we'll stop there. She wanted to get through. Act 2 goes through. 12, 7, almost. 1278. Um, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to put a quiz up over Hamlet Acts 1 and 2. I'll put it up today, but it won't be due till probably Wednesday night. So we'll finish going over Acts 2 on Monday.